Welcome to the Ortega Path to Happiness. My name is George Ortega. This is episode number 10, Enlightenment and Non-Attachment. We're taping this on June 20th, 2017. Okay, so the theme of this show is like one of the elements of enlightenment is this idea that we should cultivate a non-attachment or a detachment pretty much from, from anything that we might want. Um, this, this is derived uh, from the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, although it has similar formulations in Jainism, Baha'i, Hinduism, um, Taoism, and probably other traditions. Um, so like in, within Buddhism, it's like the first noble truth is like that, you know, life contains suffering. That's probably the most accurate um, interpretation of it. The second noble truth is that this suffering comes about um, from attachment. Now that, you know, this it's a bit confusing because they, you know, basically um, more literally the second noble truth is that, that life has dukkha or life is dukkha and dukkha is translated as um, basically what can't be fulfilled, what can't be satisfied. But, you know, regardless of, of like the literal translation of that, what it's come to mean, you know, the second noble truth is that, well, our suffering comes from our attachments, our desires, our cravings, what we want. And the problem is that, well, you know, like, <laughs> there is so much, you know, like, in this world we get, we get a lot of what we want, you know, which makes us happy, but then we don't get a lot of what we uh, want, and that limits our happiness, that may, may lead us to, like, become fearful or worry or become angry or sad, you know, and then sometimes, like, we get things and we worry about losing them, so, you know, I think, you know, I've been working on happiness for, for several decades, and, um, and I, think, I think the Buddha, if he existed, if he really said this, because who knows, um, I think he was onto something very, very powerful, very important. Just basically, even though there's more to happiness than, you know, eliminating or minimizing these wants, you know, getting good at that is, is really, really important. Um, so, all right, now, Different people kind of like interpret this, you know, idea of non-attachment in different ways. Um, for example, the Dalai Lama, his, his view is that, well, you know, the only thing we should want is happiness. And that kind of makes sense. You know, that, that I think is the most logical um, interpretation that, you know, we're hardwired biologically to seek pleasure, avoid pain. You know, our, our number one desire in life is happiness. And if we limit it to that, that does make sense. Now, sometimes in, in, in um, various traditions, in yoga and Buddhism, there's this idea of transcending happiness, so that if you don't want happiness, apparently there's another state that's, that's more blissful than happiness. To me, that doesn't really make all that much sense, because like, it would just be kind of like a, a stronger um, aspect of happiness. It would just like, but it'd be happiness. But anyway, so I think the Dalai Lama, so there's some others, you know, um, say that we shouldn't want anything that, um, that um, you know, that we shouldn't want anything at all, including happiness. And then some others say, well, um, we shouldn't want um, anything except we should want some good, some good things, some virtues in life. All right, again, but I think the... The, the most sensible interpretation of this is, is the Dalai Lama's, you know, you know it, it's hard to avoid wanting um, happiness. Now, all right, actually, my, my way is similar to the, to the Dalai Lama's. I mean, in a certain sense, for example, like if I was eating, you know, a bowl of soup, right, and I had a spoon, right, and, um, and somebody asked me, do you want a spoon? I'd say, no, you know, I, I wouldn't want a spoon because I already have one. So to, to a certain extent, most of us, the vast majority of us are already happy. So from that standpoint, it seems like we wouldn't need to want happiness also. But I, I, I think that the deeper truth to that is like, I think we're always wanting greater happiness. You know, in other words, like, maybe because of our experience in the womb or in early childhood, you know, there's a memory 
within us of, of much greater happiness, of this kind of like real bliss state without all the worries and stuff that we accumulate as we become older, you know, leave childhood and stuff. And I think that memory kind of like just propels us to wanting greater happiness. So, um, so yeah, so that's, you know, that's, and um, so yeah, I try to cultivate this idea of, of wanting more happiness, but then I guess um, making it more of a preference than a, an act of desire. Even now, I mean, like, no, I think because I work on it. I mean, I, I basically work on it like some people go to the gym every day, you know, just really, you know, because if, if happiness is the only thing that we should want, the only thing worth wanting, because everything else is a means to happiness, it just makes sense to work on it. And it's, it's really kind of like logically impossible to be working on it without also wanting it. So, all right, so. Um, now, so like this idea of, of <laughs> non-attachment is it's related to a similar Buddhist concept of impermanence. I mean, the idea is like this is, isn't just Buddhism. This is physics. This is basic science, um, basic logic. Things change, you know. In other words, we, we might have, we've got our youth when we're young. We lose it when we get older. We've got our health, but, you know, um, unless we, you know, have some accident where <laughs> we just die instantly, we, we generally get, you know, we become ill and die or something. Like, there's, there, there are things, you know, you know, the blessings that we have will, um, will kind of like, you know, change, you know, we, we, um, you know and, and again, like our death, I think, is the most profound uh, manifestation of that. Whatever we have in this life, you know, we kind of like move from it when we die. So, so it's this idea of impermanence. So the, the idea is that like, it doesn't make sense to become attached to things that are going to change. You know, again, you can also use this um, in the converse, the idea that like, well, when things aren't going according to how we want them to go, and again, we're, we're trying not to want them to go anyway, we're trying to be happy regardless, uh, that we, we can know that things will change also. Okay, um, so, so the problem with attachments, there are several problems. Uh, the, the one, the first one we kind of like got into already, it's just this idea that like in, in our in our life, especially in this modern world where we're inundated, if, if people watch TV or just like look through newspapers, magazines, you know, on the internet, there are so many advertisements for products, for services, for things that, that presumably we, in other words, <laughs> the problem for us is that like our economic system is founded on cultivating wants, you know, these people who, who sell whatever it is, a cell phone, um, you know, a, a dinner, a vacation, whatever it is, clothing, you know, whatever it is that, you know, <laughs> our, our economy is, is, is based on, on producers, you know, basically cultivating desires in consumers and we're all consumers and, you know, not, none of us can escape this. So, um, so naturally, like if we're inundated with all these things that we don't have, um, it's kind of hard to, to avoid not wanting some of these things. Um, and, and that's the thing. So like, you know, basically any time like we, we might see an advertisement for something, you know, um, a, a cooler cell phone or something that has more features, that it's mu much faster, whatever it is, then, you know, like, we, we imagine, oh, things would be better, you know, we would be happier if we had, you know, whatever it was, right? And that's the, 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 the basic, you know, um, premise behind anything we want. The only reason we would want anything is because we predict it's going to, like, lead to the only thing we really want is to, to be happier. So, you know, this idea of non-attachment is that um, it kind of, like, cues us in to this reality that our happiness, our greater happiness, isn't really related to what's happening out there, isn't really related to having or getting what we want. Okay, so, so the idea is like, to the extent that we want these things we don't have, we're gonna like cultivate a, um, a desire for them and that desire, to the extent that they're not fulfilled, leads to disappointment, okay, so that's, you know, that's, um, that's the problem that this attachment 
creates, that our attachments create in terms of dependencies. Okay. Um, now, all right, this is like a, this is a, 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 an ideal. It's a powerful ideal. It, it makes a lot of sense. But, you know, in, like in Buddhism, there's this absolute reality, and then there's kind of like this pragmatic reality, just like the way things are and the way we live our life. So with, with this idea of non-attachment, um, one thing, for example, according to happiness research that isn't really related to Buddhism at all, one of the major ways that we human beings derive our happiness is by making progress toward a goal. Now, a goal might be to get a better job, to, you know, to move to a bigger apartment, to buy a new car, whatever it is. Um, and we're making progress toward, or, you know, to achieve like some kind of a project. You know, you, you, we start working on something, or maybe we're a musician, we want to get better at whatever it is, uh, and we, we make progress toward this goal. So, so again, it, get, it gets complicated, because like, if we have a goal that we're setting, and, and like, it's pretty impossible to live life without goals. I mean, like, even like, for example, there's this expression that like, before enlightenment, you know, carry water, chop wood, whatever, you know, there's things that we do. And after, after enlightenment, you know, carry water, chop wood. So th there's things we have to do, and they involve, they are goals. It's like we set goals. Uh, we want to straighten up our apartment. We want to, like, you know, um, mow the lawn. We want to plan for vacation, whatever it is. Um, it's hard. It, it's like, I, I think it's pretty logically impossible to not, introduce attachments, desires to these kinds of things. So, but, but I guess I, the, the meaning, the, the, the more central meaning behind this is like, fine, we, we have these things that we want and, and, and we're gonna like, you know, with happiness research, they, they suggest that we enjoy this process of, of, of getting to, to where we wanna be. A lot of times people, you know, say that like life Happiness isn't so much a goal as, it's not so much a destination as a journey. You know, it's really like the, the you know, a lot of people who've become very successful, they'll, they'll kind of recount that their greatest happiness wasn't when they became very successful, it was really the, the, the steps that they achieved on the way to that. So, so basically, um, you know, we, we, we kind of like enjoy, it's not like we're gonna, um, disavow or, or choose not to feel these, these pleasures of achievement and, and accomplishment and, you know, um, stages in, in, in our goals. We're not going to, like, choose to not feel the, the happiness that comes from them. But I guess the, the, the idea is to not become attached to them, to, to kind of, like, see them. It, it's, it's um, part of it is, like, um, understood by the Stoics, the Greek philosophers uh, who developed Stoicism, and part of what they said was that, like, all right, we work on, on let's say, virtues, on, on good things, plans that we value, that we predict are going to create more happiness for ourselves, for those we love, you know, s something that we consider good, and we work on it, and we don't, we, we enjoy working on it, but since we, it's not up to us, whether we might succeed at anything, you know, I mean, any, any goal that we set, you know, ultimately, you know, most fundamentally, whether we succeed at it or not is, is not up to us. So the, the Stoics understood this. You know, we can't, like, assure that we'll succeed at what we try. So, so they, they basically recommended, which is very much in line with this Buddhist idea of non-attachment, to kind of, like, to be satisfied making the effort and, and not, to, not to become upset or frustrated if we don't uh, achieve our goal. In other words, we should be satisfied that we did our best, that we, we tried, and you know, that, that's all we can do. Uh, this, this relates to this idea that, that we don't really have a free will. That, you know, a lot of the Stoics understood this. Um, okay, so um, now another kind of challenge that this idea of non-attachment brings us is like one of the one of the powerful ways of becoming happier that we uh, and happiness again is like such an important element of enlightenment it's, it's probably the number one element that you know i think virtue goodness is is 
up there right along with it, you know. And we have to drive our happiness in ways that don't impinge upon the happiness of others or are detrimental to our health and, you know. But, um, but basically, um, one of the, one of the, um, one of the <coughs> most important, most, most powerful means of feeling happy, of becoming happier, is to feel gratitude. And a lot of times, for, exa for example, in this world that we live in, um, you yeah, know, we could be like, especially in this society, you know, living here in New York, um, New York State, you know, even the very poorest among us um, have better lives in so many ways than, than the richest kings a couple of hundred years ago. I mean, you know, the, um, just being able like, you know, to take a bus and, and travel, you know, 50 miles for like a couple of dollars or, to, you know, um, pretty much everyone has a cell phone now or most people. I mean, just like, just the, the kind of the, what, this world is so amazing, you know, in so many ways. We have so many blessings, but, you know, what happens is that we get accustomed to them. A lot of kids today, you know, they, they were born after the internet was um, developed and they just like, it, it, they kind of take it for granted. And we adults do that also, you know, like even though we, we you know, we weren't born into it, um, after a while we become accustomed to it. And the problem with that is like, when that happens, we fail to appreciate what we have. So, you know, so the idea like in, in happiness, there's this idea that we should cultivate gratitude. Okay, so now there's, you know, if we're gonna like think about gratitude relative to non-attachment, you know, it's a difficult kind of um, um, integration, you know, because basically to, to feel grateful for something in a certain way suggests that, that we value it, you know, that, that, I mean, that, that's what it's about, valuing what, what we have, valuing the, the, the blessings in our life. But sometimes, like, when we cultivate gratitude as a happiness, as a means to happiness, as a means to becoming happier, then we, we kind of, like, fill our minds with, with these wonderful things we have, you know, enough food, uh, we have a dwelling, we have friends, we have clothing, we have opportunities, you know, all these blessings. And, you know, again, relative to this Buddhist concept of non-attachment, the problem with that is that to the extent that we derive our happiness in that way, we're cultivating attachments to these blessings we're grateful for. So, um, so it, um, I, it's, it's, it's difficult to negotiate these two kinds of like, because yes, feeling grateful does work, but again, it has this, this double-edged sword of, of, of creating dependencies. So I, I think that, um, well, what I, I mean, what I do, yeah, it's one thing like, you know, for example, if it's a sunny day out, right, and, 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 and you're out and you're enjoying it, you want to feel grateful for that, right? And it's a pleasure that you that you accept, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a means to happiness that you accept, and you can apply this to any blessing you have, but, um, but it, it's something that you don't want to, that you uh, want to not base your happiness on. Um, when, when I'm working on my happiness, I try to, um, this gets us into the, 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 um, the topic of direct versus indirect happiness. Um, Indirect happiness is kind of like, you know, being grateful for what we have, you know, just having what we, what we want, getting what we want, you know, all these things that are from outside of us. We perceive something as valuable, we, we want it, we get it, and that's it's kind of an indirect form because it's, it basically relies on something outside of ourselves. Um, direct happiness, which is the happiness that I promote, you know, as, as like the, the wisest happiness within this context of enlightenment, uh, has to do with understanding that while we can, you know, achieve our, our happiness in indirect ways that, um, that basically, you know, are derived from things outside of us, that those ways really just attach us to those things. And so a much wiser way for us to obtain our happiness is directly, and what, what I do basically is, um, is cultivate the, the skill, because this really is a skill, 
of, of feeling happy for no other reason than it feels good. And, you know, I've done episodes of, of this, you know, on this. Uh, basically, it's the idea of smiling because smiling activates this physiological, you know, um, response that it, it just evokes the feeling of happiness without even our intending to evoke it, you know, just by smiling. But beyond that, you know, just as like with enlightenment, meditation is a very powerful means to, uh, for kind of like understanding oneself, understanding who one is, as opposed to trying to understand the external world, which is a bit less uh, important to enlightenment. So like relative to the meditation, basically what happens is one can um, meditate, focus, and all, you know, virtually all meditation is about focus, focusing on the breath, on a, on a mantra, or whatever. So the idea here is basically we focus on the feeling of happiness. That's the practice. That's what I do. I, 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 I practice just summoning up the feeling of happiness, staying with it, focusing on it, sustaining it, amplifying it, you know, making it stronger. And, and the key, again, the key thing here is to, to do it in a way that doesn't involve attachment. Again, you, you know, it's pretty hard to, to avoid being attached to the feeling of happiness and that that's what we want. But outside of that, it's the idea that like, if we're going to be attached to happiness, we should be attached to it in a way that's least dependent on what's not in our control. So in other words, like if, if we're cultivating this practice of happiness by just focusing on it, and, and the key is like we, we're, we're, we are cultivating this happiness for no other reason than that it feels good. In other words, like generally, we're happy because things go our way. We're happy because we have what we want. You know, we're, we're kind of like enjoying our attachments. We're kind of like, we're feeling fortunate. We, we get what we want. We're on our way of, to getting what we want. And we, per, we perceive that as positive and that evokes the feeling of happiness. So, all right, fine, that's indirect happiness. But, you know, a way of, of, of more wisely obtaining our happiness that is very in line with this philosophy of non-attachment is to cultivate the practice and the philosophy, really, of, of deriving one's happiness simply because it feels good. In other words, like, um, we can do this. We can feel happy for no other reason than it feels good to, to feel happy. That's, that's an important you know, point to consider. Um, all right, so, um, so part of this non-attachment, you know, again, we started off with this. Um, we become attached to life. Well, you know, we're all going to die. And actually, actually, you know, I guess we're eventually we'll all die. But like, you know, I've been reading uh, up on artificial intelligence and um, just the advances in, in nanotechnology and robotics and genetic engineering. And it is very probable that within the next several decades, uh, through, through various technologies, we'll be able to stop the aging process and stop the deterioration, the, the process of illness in the body. There, there are actually some species of, of animals in, in the world, uh, I think there's a turtle and a few other species, that they, they, they don't get sick, they don't ever get sick, and they, they don't ever die of old age, you know. And the only way they die is like, you know, some other animal eats them <laughs> or, or some accident. So, so I, I think what I'm trying to say here is that like, yes, you know, eventually, you know, our kids, you know, these millennials or whatever, young kids, you know, they may be living three, four, five hundred years. Who knows? We have this technology, but eventually they're going to die too. I mean, we all, you know, the sun's going to burn out, whatever. So the idea is we want to kind of like, you know, basically overcome our attachment to life and, and also to pain. In terms of life, you know, I mean, I, it's interesting. I, um, in Buddhism, there, Buddhism, there's a kind of like um, an idea of reincarnation. I mean, personally, I, I prefer to believe, you know, without any evidence, I just believe this because it makes me feel better, that, that we, that everybody, everybody who's ever lived, everybody who will ever live <laughs> once we die, we go to, a, to this bliss. And, and, you know, I don't have any evidence for this. Um, and, and I say everybody, some people might object to that. Some people say, well, how about like, you know, Hitler? How about like these really horrible people? 
And, and yes, I say everyone, including them, because you know, I, I did a series um, before this on this idea that we don't have a free will, that you know, we are the way we are because of forces outside of us. And you know, in, in, incidentally, you know, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, you know, three of our very greatest minds, you know, understood this, this position. That's their position. We don't have a free will. So from that standpoint, it just like doesn't seem fair to kind of like, you know, deprive, you know, even really bad people of, of this like, you know, eternal bliss, whatever, because, you know, again, it, it wasn't up to them. All right, we're running out of time. We've got a minute and a half. Um, so, so we want to kind of like just overcome our attachment to this life, you know, and ideally it, it, it helps if you have a philosophy, the reincarnation, you're going to be born again, or that, you know, when we die, we go to a better place. And we also, you know, this is hard, but to, um, to overcome our attachment to not wanting to feel pain. Um, you know, again, like the first noble truth is like in life there is suffering. Now, sometimes we can feel pain and not necessarily suffer, although that's a, that's a complicated kind of dis distinction. But, you know, we, we kind of, we don't, to the extent that we can overcome our fear of pain, our attachment to, to living pain-free or suffering-free, then we don't fear that suffering. We don't, you know, it's not something we, we would worry about. I mean, I, granted, this is, ex you know, I'm, I'm talking theory. It's, it's extremely difficult to, to accomplish, but, you know, it, it is a goal. Okay, um, and, and lastly, you know, we don't want to idolize people. We, we don't want to say, well, I can't live b b b um, without him or without her or whatever. I mean, that again is complicated. We'd have to devote a show on that because like other people are our main source of happiness and it gets into it more. But all right, so we're out of time. I hope you all enjoyed this. So, um, you know, we will continue to explore the elements of enlightenment and understand how we become either enlightened, enlightened or more enlightened. Thanks for watching.